Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. I'm joined this week with by Liz Simi, the uh, co-founder of Honey Tree Investment Management. We're going to discuss all things ESG. I have some distrust, and I think Liz does too. So it's going to be pretty interesting because she built her firm looking to rectify what she perceived to be uh, some problems with the way that the industry treated ESG. So we'll talk about that. None of this is financial advice. We're not your financial advisors. We're not your fiduciary. Do your own due diligence. Hire an advisor. Don't come here for financial advice. Just entertainment purposes only, folks. So uh, with that out of the way, Liz, how you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm very excited to talk to you. I am excited to talk to a true ESG skeptic. Indeed. Indeed, I am. I had the catalyst for this conversation was I had sent out a tweet about an investment that I have in Altria, which I feels bad even saying out loud. So I at least acknowledge that there's something wrong morally potentially with cigarettes. But as you and I talked, you had mentioned to look into some of the sugar stats and then we started to talk further and I said, you know what? I like the way that, that she looks at the world. So do you want to sort of lay out the the framework that you have from the beginning and then maybe we can get into the depth and the nuance of the conversation as we go? So even the best companies in the world do bad stuff. This idea that there's the, the impact can be attributed to the, just the products and the services that companies produce ignores all the negative externalities that, that all companies produce. And so if you, if you want to improve impact and reduce negative externalities, you need to invest in companies fixing them. And one way to do that is, is the approach we take, which is we, we think of useful ESG data as fundamental company data. So we think of workforce data and environmental inputs and outputs as, as bottom line tied fundamental company data. And it, we, we use that in addition to financials to assess the long-term responsible growth of companies. So that, that's our approach in a very short nutshell. Can I just like, just to clarify it, if, if I'm like a five-year-old, basically you're looking at financials, two financials assume that they're equal, the next set of financial data, or not next, but a, a sort of part of your mosaic is their how they handle the ESG side of their business. Is that fair? Yeah, but we treat it equally. So okay. we look at diversity, w- women in, in leadership roles change year over year uh, alongside cash flow growth, for example. And we think they're both evidence of competent governance and sustainable growth over time. And now we're very long-term investors. You know, We're assessing different stuff than, say, many portfolio management teams, but that's how we use the data. And uh, and just so that I understand, like when you are saying that they're equal, you're going to pass on a company that today may be over earning and is cheaper, but has no real diversity in it. And I think that some of your, your thought process, not to put words in your mouth, but is probably that that is sort of a rent extraction from society and not so much a sustainable long-term outcome. Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, it's also points to their board and their management team not figuring out yet how to hire any woman or racially diverse folks, which, you know, the, the ship's been sailing for a while, folks. This is uh, And so it, it is absolutely what you first said. It is the net economic impact on society of unequal wages, unequal leadership opportunity within corporations. That's the direct impact um, that, that large and small corporations make. But we really see it as an insight into the quality of the governance team you know, you have a lot of large tech companies who have large diversity and inclusion teams and, and produce all these websites and, and and set all these goals, but they can't move the needle on, you know, above 15% women in tech or above 2.5% black folks in leadership. And and so it's all, it's great. They, they get check marks on all the ESG stuff for all the stuff that they've done, but they're not executing anything. And, and so that's what we're really trying to dig into with the useful non-financial data is, is this team committed to 
anything long term? Are they capable of setting goals and are they capable of executing on them? So it's not, we don't do our traditional portfolio process over here and then have an ESG set of data or a separate ESG research team as, as many firms do to kind of complement. We truly think of the, the ESG inputs that we use as fundamental company data. I like how you put that because it adds an element of context to the to the financial data that you're looking at where I could see the argument for if two entities are trading at the same free cash flow yield with the same growth prospects or whatever, the underwritability of the growth prospect in the entity that has a higher ESG score is probably a little bit more certain. I mean, I know nothing's certain, right? But I think that the way that they're approaching it is arguably less risky. Is that a yeah, and thing it's, to say? Or? It's, it's for a couple reasons. What we're actually looking for is stakeholder governance. Is this team working together for a shared purpose? Because then they're more efficient. Folks who've worked, who, you know, folks in team sports or folks who've worked for not well-managed corporations versus well-managed corporations understand how much stakeholder engagement, especially employees, but also customers matters to the bottom line. And it's, it's, it's hard to do properly and it's impossible to assess with financials only. So that's what we're really looking for. That's what we believe outperforms over the long run. The, these purpose-driven stakeholder governed organizations are, they drive, they, their bottom line grows because of the impact they're driving among their stakeholders. And, and again, it's, it's a very different mindset than most traditional investment approaches at the same time, the, the academic evidence backs it up. If you don't, piss off all your employees and 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 have lower turnover and have less women leaving the workforce and you know better recruiting abilities if you save water you use less water less waste disposal you're saving money this is all bottom line stuff but at the same time it also has to do with that net impact that these companies make and you know one of the things i found most fascinating and one of the reasons we started our firm and we're we're going to get into this in detail is the end client, so the true end client of responsible investing, it's not about how they feel. It's not about feeling good. It's not about values. They believe companies positively impacting the world who care about their stakeholders are better investments over the long term. They're not interested in, in shareholder primacy models, which is, which is most investment theory. They care just as much about making money, but their underlying belief is that Companies that do bad things eventually will will get into trouble. I mean, it's an additional risk. And we we as an industry, you know, it, the original, I have to say, there are people doing this correctly other than Honey Tree in the world, whether they're allocators or managers or advisors who are, who are building portfolios or, or picking managers based on the same beliefs as us. What has happened is the large financial conglomerate globally has obviously taken an interest in ESG. And the problem is, no offense to big banks, they're like the worst industry in terms of ESG, especially their asset, in terms of ESG scores themselves. In, Why in, is that? In, in capital markets and asset management. Well, is that a diversity thing? It is. So here's how banks, and I was in a bank for about 12 months, so it, it was fascinating. The bank side, so the the bank and insurance, in, and this is Canadian, you know, this is mostly Canadian US banks, but I'm sure it applies globally. The bank sides have done some work on equity. So they've gone from 20% woman VPs to 30 or 40% woman VPs on the retail and the operations and the tech side of the big banks. Because, I mean, they needed high, higher ESG scores, but they also, they cared about this stuff. They, they knew they had a problem in, in, in finance and they could do something. The capital markets folks and the asset management folks didn't do anything. And so you, you, they, you're still at 15%, you know, women PMs in most of the, the large shops, even the ESG leading managers globally, right? We have a number of insurance companies and asset managers in Canada who are some of the leading ESG managers globally, and they're stalled at under 15% women in senior leadership positions. And so they're the ones creating ESG research in, in the context of portfolio construction. They're leading the discussions globally. They're sitting on the diversity and inclusion panels. Yet there are so many industrial companies and retail companies who've done so much more work and so much more improvement. Anyways, it's 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 a big it's a big mess, and it's it's a mix of kind of 
they don't know what to do, how do you how do you change your investment methodology to include non-financial data? How do you integrate it equally? How do you integrate it so it actually impacts security selection, right? And so that's where we kind of are. So you have some very, there's a large pension in Quebec, the Caisse de Dépôt de Placement de Quebec. So they're one of Canada's biggest pensions. And they, about two years ago, tied emissions reductions to bonuses for their portfolio Hmm. managers, because that's, Hmm. that's a huge initiative in Quebec. Quebec's pretty you know, emissions environmentally focused, but they actually tied it to the bottom line of the PMs, not the ESG team, the PMs. And to be clear, all for the most part in the allocator world and even the PM world, most PMs are not ESG experts. There's a bunch obviously who are, but for the most part, ESG teams are separate researchers who are not involved in security selection, which is a big problem. How are you supposed to use you know, it, it doesn't work as a second, you know, it, using non-financial data does not work as a secondary consideration, especially in a shareholder focused framework, which is why we threw out the shareholder focus, focused on stakeholders. And it, it then it makes sense how one would use the data in fundamental analysis. So, you know, for those that aren't familiar with sort of how you approach things, you know, and, and, like, how do you look at a stakeholder company or look at companies through a stakeholder lens that is different, like sort of from the initial analysis, it seems to me that you and I are probably looking at securities completely differently as I currently do things. But I admit that I I do not know everything. So I'm open to learning. So if you could educate me, I would really appreciate it. So this actually goes back to my old firm. So My old firm, the only firm I've trained at as a portfolio manager, built a process that threw out most of traditional theory, which which helped when one needed to adjust it for ESG. And the reason the theory was thrown out is because there's a lot of underperformance in active management, and a lot of it comes from human bias. And if you can remove some of the human bias in the portfolio construction, you can improve your chance of outperforming over the long term. So specifically, it was about reducing PM discretion. How do you systematize as much of this process while still remaining purely active, traditional fundamental management? So the team built a quantum mental model. This is before I joined, mostly because they did not want to hire six analysts. <laughs> they were pretty cheap and small. But at the same time, they wanted to remove kind of the the concept of ideas and they wanted to systematize the, the process as much as possible. So they they used quant to cut down the S&P 500 to about 50 companies and then did the deep dive on there. And it, it's not traditional factor-based quant. It was really about identifying the highest dividend growers. So then you have a consideration set and you do the deep dive from there. And we took a very, we'll call it cash flow, revenue, dividend, debt-focused fundamental deep dive to really assess whether they were going to continue growing their dividend at a high rate. The consistency of the governance team. How long-term are they focused? How, how do they keep on doing this? And, and what was fascinating is fossil fuel never really showed up. Energy, because of the cyclicality, obviously doesn't have high dividend growth, like when we're talking like 15% plus, but also just being cyclical didn't fit into that consistent consistent growth model. So Then everybody started launching ESG strategies. And I was like, I was excited. I, 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 you know, I was intrigued. I'm, you know, a pretty progressive millennial. So, you know, this has always been something I cared about. And and when I was at one of the big banks, I'd done a, a, like I'd gone through all the ESG products in Canada and they were all like total crap. They were all like all oil sands, all pharma, all companies, really not making the world a better place. So there wasn't any product. So I was really excited at this time that there's, you know, the big banks were taking it seriously. They were looking at equity. They were doing all this stuff. And then they just launched the same set of problematic products. So what we realized, my co-founder, Paula Glick and I, is we could take that quantum mental portfolio construction, which threw out um, most traditional finance theory, but worked, by the way, it was about three and a half percent over the S&P over 10 years annualized. So with no FANG stocks, which is important. So we knew that that methodology worked, but we knew we could bring in non-financial data into that methodology equally. 
because we're really, again, trying to assess the same thing, the long-term consistent growth of a company. And so that's what we did. We took basically exactly the same fundamental deep dive as we would have before and similar qualification criteria, except we added in a whole bunch of non-financial stuff. So we don't we don't look at high dividend growth because there's not enough high dividend growers not destroying the world, really. And that's why we call it responsible growth. So in order to get into our consideration set, there's some fundamental requirements some functional requirements, but you need to have a board that's 30% diverse. So we will not look at a company who hasn't figured out how to get to 30% board diversity, which is really not hard. I, I wanted to start at 40, but we, we had to reduce it to 30. We'll probably be able to put it up to 35 or 40 this year or next year. And, Can you and define diversity? Exactly. Good question. Almost every ESG data set and most managers look at diversity, especially on the board through a gender only lens. So if you look at any ESG rating or, or, or whatever, the talk is generally around women on boards, which is fine to start. But then folks got to understand there's a lot more to diversity. And so we, from the beginning, we looked specifically at racial diversity in addition to gender diversity. We would like to look at disability and LGBTQ, but that's only starting to be reported. So diverse, racial diversity, gender diversity is kind of straightforward, except you know there, there, there is some nuances there. But racial diversity, so that's a good question. How do you define racial diversity? So we define it as, we define diversity as non-male, non, if you're not the, if you're not a male of the dominant race of that country. So in Asia, if you're not an Asian male, you're considered diverse. It gets very tricky. Asia has awful diversity, by the way, gender diversity specifically, but obviously racial diversity. So that's how we have is that is, are those my kids screaming in the back yeah but it's all good don't worry about it so that's how we've and we've so we've built those data sets ourselves because you can't buy them only now only this year have i started to see a couple producers i think refinitive finally had one but folks are have still are still generally if you look through most of the ratings it's really it's about gender diversity on board, gender diversity in management team, woman in leadership year over year. And, and they're just starting to be able to bring in some of the, the racial equity data. We're lucky because in 2018, over half of our kind of consideration set that we were looking at was reporting it. So hmm. most companies don't report it, but the good companies do. Yeah. Well, you're going to market what you're good at, right? Well, it's it's interesting. I don't, I don't mean that in a no, picture. No, no. I'm not saying like yeah. putting it down. I'm just saying if you're proud of it, you're going to say it. Yeah. But it became a requirement in the US. Mm. That's why. So yeah. it's it's actually these these kind of regional standards on, on various things, whether it's water or, or emissions or equity. And there's a California equity report that all the companies who operate there have to fill out every year, which goes into depth on racial diversity and gender diversity of their workforce at all the levels. So as that's been kind of required over the past couple of years, folks are just dumping that in their report. And so what's going to happen in the next five years is that data, pay equity, turnover, um, retention, geographic distribution of the workforce, and then the same kind of set of data for the environmental inputs and outputs is going to be standardized in the financials by the auditors. And so that's not me making it up, although I've been kind of talking about it for six months. The IFRS is taking it over. The auditors who have the most money- Which is to, the International Accounting Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys. The for standards. Those don't know. Yeah. And, and so there's been all these groups globally trying to standardize the ESG data. And again, it doesn't work if it's a separate set of data nobody's it, it's not being considered in security selection if it's kind of just floating over there and the reason the auditors are going to do it is they've already been auditing the more advanced reports so you can find annual reports that include all the data that i've talked about audited by pwc and ey so it's it's it, and it's not most of the data that's in an esg or sustainability report will be thrown out I'm not i'm not saying this whole 80 page sustainability report is going to be translated to the the audited financials, but the 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 quantifiable workforce and environmental inputs and outputs in general, it were not too far away from them being relatively systematized alongside the financials. So it, it's 
I mean, that's where that's where so many of the problems in the industry come from is, is a lot of PMs in ESG or firms in ESG, they still think of it separate, right? They, their, their investment philosophy is considering them as secondary or tertiary inputs. And yet they're selling equity and sustainability and future and all this stuff. And it, there's a big disconnect there. So we'll come back to these people that are fake salespeople here shortly. But why... Why do I care, Liz? Like I'm, I'm trying to outperform here, and I need to have the the widest subset of selection that I can. And you know, all this woke stuff is for politics, right? It's not for capitalism. So w- why should I care at all what you're saying right now? So I think you know what we do is very specific for concentrated active investors. So if you're a concentrated active investor. You know, the reason you should care about this non-financial data or the way we do things is because purpose-driven companies outperform in the long run. If you're a short-term investor, if you're more focused on beating the market short-term, obviously our strategy is never going to apply given how long-term focused it is. But it's really, it's really, you know, you described it earlier. It is additional insight into the quality of a company. And so if if long-term consistency of growth and sustainability of the corporation is, is important to your process or, or your investment needs, the addition of non-financial information allows you to go deeper into that. And a lot of it, again, because it's been separated and there's been all this extra data created, it seems nonsensical. But when you go through the company reporting and you can see progress and you can see useful data because it's getting more useful every year you you can kind of and and if you come from the right framework right it's it's okay to believe that diverse teams don't outperform but the academics say they do right it's okay to say that water use and and waste and emissions don't matter but at the same time they do but then here's one of the first problems well i mean i guess i've talked about a bunch of problems but you know net zero Right. So here's one of the negative impacts. So now everybody needs to be net zero. So now everybody's planting trees, you know, switching off their regular grid and going to buy the limited amount of renewables being produced and and then, you know, clapping their hand, like, you know, saying that they're done. They've achieved a net zero. And that's not the problem. We can't just we can't just go through the world kind of tick boxing, fixing these problems, you know, net zero. One of the things that bothers me about what is, the, what is I mean I think yeah. I know what net zero is but you're talking about emissions right yeah so there, there's two types of net zero there's marketing net zero which is we've bought all our energy from a renewable and planted some trees but we haven't changed any of our processes like commuting packaging shipping you know delivery all the stuff that that create business travel we haven't we haven't changed any of that of that but we bought offsets to make up for it like wh- what's the point. That's just buying offsets. It, it, it's, yeah, you can't do that. No. I, th- I thought that was fine, right? You just stroke a check and don't change your life, and everything's yeah. good. No, no. And so the oh, okay. science-based target initiative, which is what true net zero is, is actually involves reducing outputs, right? You know, and, and it's fascinating what folks can do. I can't remember which company this is, but you can just just redesign your packaging and reduce your shipping volume by 40 percent. It saves money. It, you can ship more and it's much better for the environment. And so the smart companies are thinking about it that way. And, and those are the companies that we want to invest in. And so we need to look at how they're innovating packaging and inputs in, and how they're shifting from you know virgin materials to recycled materials. Like Nike and Adidas kind of seem evil in lots of ways. But they're going to be at 100% of their products being made with recycled materials in the next five years, right? That's what we need companies to do. We need them to solve all the problems. We need small companies to solve a whole bunch of problems. We need big companies to solve a whole bunch of problems. And those that solve those problems also will make more money because they'll still be around and they won't be lagging on restrictions and they won't be dealing with lawsuits and they'll be gaining market share. And it's not... I just like to think of it as the impact that they make is what drives their bottom line. And it's not about, you know, that they're, you know, lifting all children out of poverty. That's that's not what it's about. It's they're paying for decent work. They're 
training their employees. They're paying equitably. They're, they're changing their recruiting to be, they're doing all these things that impact far beyond their company to, to their, their community and stakeholders. But that is also what ends up driving their performance. So the, one of the thoughts that's going through my head here is, you know, on one hand, you, so let's just talk about offshoring labor, for example, right? On one hand, you're providing an opportunity for a population that otherwise would not have one. On the other, you're sort of hollowing out the middle class here is at least the perception. And I think some of that's true and some of it's political. When I say here, I'm in the U.S., you're in Canada. So I guess how do you sort of look at a situation and assess maybe what group of people should win and what group of people should lose in an equation like that? That's a really good one. Most of the companies we look at obviously have some aspect of global operations. You look at regional turnover, for example, and it's always higher the lower you go down on the, we'll call it the pay scale by region, right? So you had you might have a firm with factories in China or Vietnam and the US and Europe and you know, the turnover in the US is 10 in Europe, it's five in, in China, it's a hundred in Vietnam, it's 85%. And so it's really nuanced, right? You know, do the China production question comes up. If we have a problem with forced labor, like we can't hold it, we, we can't hold like any companies in the world because anybody producing anything in China is both complicit with the Chinese government and at the same time, it's not their fault, right? So it's it's really, really, really tricky. Now, just to be fair, we exclude dictatorships. So we will not hold a Chinese company. But most of our companies have production and, and clients in China, right? So that's, it, it gets the, the line, it gets very messy in there. So the same, the outsourced or, or overseas outsourcing, whether high end or low end, you're right. You are creating jobs. You are creating community impact in those countries where those jobs are being sent. Hopefully it's decent, right? Because there's lots of companies who would exploit a lot of folks. But at the same time, we're driving development. You know, our demand in, in the West and obviously China's got lots of demand. The jobs, you know, we, <laughs> nobody wants to do factory jobs in Canada, for $20 an hour, right? Especially since they used to be 40, which is a whole other issue. We could talk about labor rights and stuff for, for two years. But yeah, it is, you know, so when the data is more thorough, when we can compare working at a semiconductor factory is very different than working at a Nike shoe factory, right? In terms of pay, in terms of training, in terms of specialties and all that stuff, Yeah. right? So, you know, one of the reasons the semis end up actually being quite good companies and rating high in ESG is because they've always had that high-end manufacturing. So they, mm. they, they've globally had, you know, manufacturings in terms of regulations, in terms of safety, in terms of all that stuff is way ahead. And then you have companies like Apple who don't own their manufacturing. So they're separated from it. So it's, 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 a, it, it's a fascinating global kind of intersection, uh, like a globalization intersecting with industry differences, intersecting with why the heck does any of this matter at all, right? Yeah. Like, why does it, any yeah. of it matter? Well, it matters to me for for the bottom line, obviously. But, you know, we have, we have to do full systems change. We've screwed up the world lots in various ways. And, and we haven't, we have so much opportunity to increase economic capacity everywhere. And a lot of that is equity and a lot of that is not killing ourselves with pollution. We can not, you know, we'll always need plastic, but we cannot, we can change the fact that we live, you know, every day touching 10, 15 plastic objects. Like we can rethink this. We can use that recycled plastic, right? We can think of ways to, to be more efficient. And so it's, you know, we like to think, we like to think that just tech is doing all the innovation when, Consumer packaged goods companies, industrial companies, all these these firms have the potential to change everything and make a whole bunch of money while they're doing it. And it's, I love the nuances of ESG because they're so, you know, like the the Altria, right? Yeah. How so like booze, sugar, 
tobacco, right? Weed. Weed. I don't think weed's that bad. I don't understand why people have a problem with it. But um, I don't either. So this, but this is the issue, right? Then some people will be like, "Well, it's a vice. It's got to be bad." And yeah. It's like, well, I, I'm not sure that it, weed is worse than a pharmaceutical company. Yeah, OxyContin is far. So pharmaceuticals. Let me talk about pharmaceuticals first. We don't exclude pot, by the way. We exclude tobacco. We also exclude companies who do things like uh, Purdue, but. And we don't exclude alcohol, but I, you know, there's lots of problems with alcohol. Sugar. Let me talk about sugar. Sugars. Everybody knows sugar's bad, but for some reason, it gets treated like it's it's food, so it's okay. Like we all eat it anyways. Yeah. Let's just let's just give up. Alcohol's bad, and tobacco's bad. The sugar industry, the the confectionery industry, the corn syrup industry. The agribusiness related to all that have been just driving lies about sugar addiction and corn syrup and production, just like Purdue, just like the tobacco folks, right? And and whether it's in cereals, you know, we were, I think it's somewhere in the thread on Twitter, there was this stamp you could get in Canada called health check. So you'd get it on cereal boxes and cookies and slightly healthier stuff. And the thing is, I worked in market research before investing. We had clients, it, it, was a, it was a branding firm who was selling a health check. And so you just paid them five grand and then they put it on your box and then you were a health check in the aisle, right? And okay, these were- hang on, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. We got to talk about this. Yeah, and so, these were sugary, okay, so, sugary cereals. So basically what you're talking about is just motivated reasoning, stamping a product approval label on yep. just a-, a yeah, like cereal a, box. On a product, right? Yeah. yeah, and you saw that from the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I we we had clients who who were, you know, cereal or cookie or whatever. It's the same thing as ESG. How do we get it? How do we convince without doing much? How do we brand this as slightly healthier for you, slightly better option? It, it's called ESG light, which is most of the industry, right? It's here's our same process. We didn't really change much. We hired an ESG manager. We signed the PRI, so the Principles for Responsible Investing. And then that makes us healthy. Yeah. It's all virtue signaling. Yes. Yeah. It's all. And lots of companies do that in their their ESG reporting, in their, their CSR reporting, right? Some companies have a lot of employees to talk about all the good things they do, to fill out all the surveys, to check all the boxes. That doesn't make them better. That just means they hired people to fill them out. I want companies who who actually care less about that, but are doing the work without the advertising. Because yeah. that it just no, that it's, makes it's, sense. They're people real. that are living it. Yeah, they're they're living it. They at their core, the board at their core needs knows they need more women leadership for the bottom line. And they've you know they're there. We have Midwestern industrial companies, who by the way, if you look at an ESG rating on them, it shows they don't disclose their equity goals, but they actually clearly disclosed their equity goals five years ago and increased their women in leadership positions from 10 to 25% over five years. Midwestern Mm. industrial company, right? Facebook, Google, those guys, they're they're like maybe one or 2%, right? In the same period with much more resources, but they don't believe it's not, they're they're not long-term sustainably focused companies. They, they don't, they're not thinking 10 years out. They're not planning for growth. They're not understanding their stakeholder impact and they're fine investments for lots of other folks, but they're not, not for us. Why do you think that they've had such a problem in that, in that, like specifically women in tech? What do you think is going on there? Women used to be more than a quarter of coders in the seventies. Same thing in portfolio management. There was, if you go back 20 years ago, it's actually higher then it's now it's really 10%. Yeah. So I can't explain to you how many times portfolio management folks, all guys have said, but Liz, women just don't like math. There's, there's nobody applying. Women are not interested in this job. And it's not a very good analyst. If you ask me. Yeah. So here's, (laughs) I'll tell you. So I, I like to tell my version of it because I think it puts it in context of how complex it is. I, my dad was in investing when I was in high school. I was in a math and science program in high school. I went into, I only applied to engineering school and then I decided I hated physics. So I switched to arts and did econ stats and a bunch of math and history. I loved it, but at no point ever did I, was I ever interested in going into the investment industry. 
One, I saw no making the world a better place opportunities. And two, when I worked at my father's office, everybody was either an old dude sitting at a mahogany desk or a support person. And so, you know, even though my father was a role model in the industry, it's, you know, as a ideological young, you know, college student, it was just not, it wasn't even something I would have ever considered. And then, then I went into market research, did that for about four years. And then my father needed a third person at his firm. And so I joined and it it was obviously like the best experience possible and built my capacity, but like the number of examples, not in and, and RBC or when I worked at the bank, here's, here's my favorite sentence. Managing director says 2016, this is a great event for your clients to bring their wives to. And there's this assumption in the investment industry, especially in places like Toronto and New York, that a PM looks a certain way. A CAEO for an asset manager looks a certain way. Women are good at ops, right? Women are good at compliance. And then you go to the conferences and, you know, the Portfolio Management Association of Canada, I guess it was 2017, I was at their conference. There was no woman on any of the panels and it was fine. That's just normal (laughs) at all these conferences. But two of the guys stood up like or stopped the talks in the middle of the talks and pointed out that there was no woman. So it's really what it is, is it's a kind of insulated industry. So tech and and investing and engineering are very insulated industries. They also absolutely have a pipeline problem. The thing is, though, you can't just say no woman applied, which I see like regularly. Our, you know, we, we, we know I've had, let's call it 40 folks ask for analyst jobs and definitely 37 of them were dudes, Right. So how do I, as a, as a founder, go find another 15 non-dude options when, when we post an analyst job? That's my job, just as finding clients. It, it, it's on the other side. How do you, pipelines are, you know, we have to make, we also have to make the industry cool. Like the industry is not cool. The industry looks kind of evil from the outside, you know? So there, there, there's, there's a huge potential with the other thing is if we're faking sustainable finance and ESG, we're not going to appeal to to any folks. And so, I mean, that's why I, I speak out. I think this industry can be good for the world. I think the entire industry can be good for the world. There's so much conflict of interest and disclosure that we can we can tear down as an industry because this is not just an ESG problem. You know, one of my my original passions is active manager underperformance. Why do we keep on paying these folks? Right. And, and and we do because we have structures and institutions and, you know, the assets don't move quickly. Also, like when you look at the industry, it's not like it was 90 percent women portfolio managers underperforming over 10 years for the, you know, the past three decades. So maybe there's some room for improvement there. But it's really, you know, it's so many things that reduce that pipeline that once hired, you know, they, there's a really big turnover issue. You know, they might be able to put 50% woman in a in a class at an investment bank or a capital markets group, but the turnover for the woman is so much higher. Yeah, why do you think that is? Because, like, have you been on a trading floor? I have. It's very dude. It's very duty. I had a woman bank exec whose husband's on one of the, the floors in Toronto say to me, this must have been last year, I had to tell him he can't say the word Bambi in front of our son. And like, I know it's done in whispers and stuff, but like, and it's really hard for somebody like me. I have a lot of guy friends. I, I've never, you know, I've never understood, but there's this unspoken assumptions that, I don't know, we're different or something. And it's a, it's the bro culture, like our team, you know, and, and we, we also are very bad at hiring in the investment management industry, especially in Toronto, you know, there is a golf course in Toronto where 50% of the male members are in are an advisor or in asset management. And so as long as you are a member of that golf club and you're a dude, you get a job. 
And they don't, you know, we're not very good at HR posting jobs. So people get hired through friends and acquaintances and it just perpetuates. So then all of a sudden you're just, it, it, so we need to, we need to change our hiring processes, right? In most of the industries you need to set target, but they, they don't even know that there's a problem, right? Like just look at BlackRock's gender diversity data. They don't even know there's a problem yet. They're leading the discussion on this. So hopefully in the next year, it'll become kind of clearer to the world, especially the ESG world that, that we're, they're just kind of sitting on their hands. And, and it's really like, you know, is it Larry? Like, I know he cares, but if he cared, he would be doing the same work as Midwestern industrial companies in terms of women portfolio managers and racially diverse portfolio managers. They'd be talking about this. So the whole thing is, 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 uh, it's just, it, the industry, the structure, the systemic issues itself don't encourage women in, in diverse folks to get in. And when they get in, it's, 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 you know, I, I didn't get invited to the bar because I'm not a guy. A lot. Yeah. Uh, a All lot. right. I didn't get invited to- I have to a come two- clean with you because I've been thinking about this. I actually was going to say that. I was going to say, I think that sometimes, I I mean, I'll just say what I mean, even though I'm afraid of how it's going to come out, whether or not people are going to shit all over me, whatever. It's the truth. You know, there were times that I would think, like, if I was at the bar and it was after work, and I don't know, there was a moment where it was like, okay, if we're going to keep going, I'm just going to go hang out with the guys, in part because, like, I can't get myself in trouble. If I'm drinking with guys, like I'm not going to ruin my marriage at all in any way, shape or form. That's not even a possibility for me. And, you know, I sort of struggled with that thought because I was like, well, on on one hand, you know, like that's so immature and just get over it or, you know, don't get hammered and not be able to control yourself. Right. That just like be an adult. On the other hand, you know, a lot of people have found themselves in bad situations that they didn't set out to find themselves in. So it's almost like the Charlie Munger tell me where I'm going to die so I don't go there type thing. And it's not, I know that that's, I'm like fearful that I'm not articulating myself appropriately. But if we're having an honest conversation, that thought definitely intruded in my mind. And I did like consciously sort of, there's always, like I've always gotten along really well with women. That's like growing up, I always had like girlfriends and stuff around, but I don't know. Then there's, there's also the part of me that knows that there is like a physical attraction element to a lot of interactions and I try to avoid it in the workplace. So I don't, I, like, I don't know how much that is a factor, but I do think that like, it would be hard to have this conversation and not acknowledge that at least probably some mentorship doesn't happen for that exact reason. Oh yeah. And, and just even just so like folks underestimate how much you benefit from spending an hour after work with your boss or a colleague. And so what you've described is just one of those natural biases. Most of society has, is it true? Maybe a little bit, you know, I met my husband at work, um, but we were beach lifeguards then, so that's a little different. There you go. It's hard not to then. Although I guess everybody was just trying to meet everybody then. It was in college. <laughs> was a um, different time. But at the same time, as you as you acknowledge, if if there's five junior folks at a firm or on a team, and one of them's not invited to drinks, regardless of what reason, they're they're missing out on a bunch of stuff. And so it's, it, there may be, you know, if they're Muslim and you think they don't drink, right. Or, or they don't drink, right. And people who don't drink get left out of a whole bunch of stuff, but that's, that's an entirely separate conversation. But yeah, it's that, that belief, that the belief that you have, it it can be extrapolated to all aspects of gender bias, right. You know, woman, you know, this woman won't work as hard because she's got to go home and take care of her kids. Whereas nobody thinks her husband needs to go home and take care of their kids, right? Oh, same thing with clients, right? You know, if now it's, I think it's getting better. I think, you know, we, we do the, the three or 4% of senior leadership and asset management is woman. It's ridiculous. 
it'll be easier when it's higher. But I think guys' beliefs are changing. Men of all ages. I think part of the reason, so most folks are not willing to say what you just said. It just festers in their brain. They worry about it. You know, well, that's good because I'm still worried about it. <laughs> most, <laughs> I, I'm not trying to get yeah. canceled out here, yeah, but yeah. I do think it's an important thing to acknowledge. Yeah, most. I mean, infidelity is another issue altogether. You can find infidelity at not work pretty easily. But the the what's what's happened? You know, it, it's taken me a long a long time even as a progressive millennial, to get the proper language around racial equity and gender equity. I've been learning for a very long time um, and unlearned a whole bunch of stuff. And so the investment dudes who care, which is a a large chunk, are just getting their kind of feet wet in the language of equity and inclusion and are just willing to talk about it, right? So, you know, five years ago, if I said, why am I not getting invited to the bar you know, there would have been some, no, 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 Now it'd be like, well, let's just invite Liz to the bar, right? So so, yeah. so we can, there's more conversation. And here's why. George Floyd. So racial equity is much harder to talk about than gender equity, especially since there's a whole bunch of white woman diversity in financial services. There's a whole bunch of us who are quite vocal about gender equity. But talking about racial equity is, for a white person, it's, it, a lot of folks are just too scared. To, to even bring it up in conversation. Same thing with gender equity, especially in investing because of all the reasons we've kind of talked about, all these belief and biases. So because of last year, a lot of the, we'll call it open-minded, looking for some way to explain kind of the issues that they saw in the industry, because there was so much talk in all industries around racial equity last year, I've seen a really big improvement in white dudes ability to talk about both issues and to be comfortable bringing them up right it's one thing for me to be comfortable bringing things up it's another for it to be a bigger conversation right you and you've already alluded to it why is why is it such low numbers of leadership right like we know there's a problem how do we fix it and so i think the last 12 months has been very interesting cuz i've been my dad is better at talking about it. You know, you go you go to conferences and lots of old dudes are talking about gender and racial equity because they see they've seen that there's a problem. They've seen that it's like a dude fest everywhere. You know, the the firms even ESG I go, every ESG firm I learn about, I go I look at their portfolio management team. And like one of the big ones in Canada has 41 PMs and one's a woman. And they're selling ESG institutionally. And they're a leader in ESG. And and so you have allocators, you have senior investment folks saying, oh, damn it. There's really a problem here. And, At and 41 PMs, can't you just be an index? Yeah, I don't like even 41 PMs, a lot of yeah, PMs. Yeah, we could, we, could, we could do seven podcasts on index hugging and shitty ass active management. I have actually stronger I I'd opinions. Like I have actually have stronger opinions, uh, but I... Because I come from such a non-traditional investment process, I, I I have a lot of strong opinions about traditional theory, and we have an as an industry have to innovate like all the other companies out there. And if we're all just twiddling our thumbs, chilling, crappy, underperforming products for one point two percent to whatever gullible soul shows up, nobody's going to trust the investment industry. You know, it's yeah. uh, we we gotta we gotta change. Nobody like even one thing that's been great for the pandemic is meeting with allocators and institutional folk in the casual world. Right. And, and allocators have always, have always been more casual than like the street and the asset managers and the dudes in suits. But you know, the, the, again, that's not going to attract a broad cross section of society to the industry wearing uptight suits and running around manically and yelling at people. Right. Like that's, that's the, like the, the wolf of wall street is the perception of our industry. And, and like that might be better than what most people actually truly think of our industry. And, and in order to recruit and change and innovate, like we got to, you know, it's not about doing ESG. You don't need to do ESG to make a whole bunch of impact and make the world a better place. You can run a good business, hire equitably, provide good jobs, great research, good product, all that stuff. And some firms are doing it, but, you know, there's, there's, there's the 
the opportunity to change the workforce is, is not, it's not about putting 50 thousand girls into finance like that's that's not the solution they it, it's it's much bigger um it, it's a much bigger problem to fix um and other, it, we're just really we're really bad at it yeah you know the other thing that i that i sort of dealt with my wife was at a big firm as an attorney and there was a guy who early in her career sort of like started to mentor her and then it turned into like, well, you should come meet me, you know, for dinner or whatever. And I don't know, like I, I, it rubbed me the wrong way. It rubbed her the wrong way, which is why it rubbed me the wrong way. But as it, as it is like, I don't know, it, it, it's, it was difficult. And then finally she left that firm and then I didn't have any problem with any of the guys at the next firm. I mean, that was like a firm full of respectable humans and not schmucks, but there's a fair amount of schmucks out there. I guess I was worried that I was a schmuck back in the day. I'm, I'm less concerned now than I was, but my a younger me was more worried. Yeah, there's bad actors, both male and female, in all firms. And in, in good firms, culture stops them from being total assholes all the time. And in poorly managed firms, they get to be assholes all the time and... and, and you know, and, and that's that's, you know, one of the things that we're kind of looking for in our research. We can't do a employee survey and figure out who all the assholes are and make sure they're being controlled. We're, we, it's the culture. It's the shared purpose. It's the 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 beliefs and the norms of an organization that allow people that, that, that don't drive them away from the firm like your wife. Yeah. Right. And, and so yeah. that's. Yeah. That firm's retention was shit. Exactly. And it, and it deserved to be. That was a terrible firm. I once. The one she joined was okay, but when it was acquired, uh, it turned into something not very good. Exactly. For a while. They may have turned now. And you can, you know, anybody who's been through reorgs, the large corporate reorgs or private equity takeover or whatever, knows that at some point the bottom line gives way to just shitty organizational management and lack of, of shared purpose. And it's it's fascinating. It is a, it's a hard to quantify academic topic. But when you've lived it and you've had to avoid it, 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 it doesn't matter if you're a retail worker or a law partner. It's the behavior in an organization, whether from an individual or, or a group or, or the organizational as a whole, impacts productivity. It impacts retention. It impacts hiring ability. You know, if you, you get a bad reputation, your hiring pool's going to be decreased severely. So it's really hard to see, too, Right. The dudes, the PMs and the analysts, don't see it. One, because, and again, most guys are great. It got, it got to underline toxic folks, guys who do inappropriate stuff, women who do toxic stuff and inappropriate stuff. They're a very small part, but because there's more dudes in investing in tech and fewer women, the sexist targeting of the bullying, because these bullies, these jerks who do bad stuff, do bad stuff to guys too. But it goes through it goes through more sexist framework, right? Hmm. And so it's just yeah. compounded, right? Versus if you so have it's like 50%. a bully is a bully. Yeah. Sorry, I don't, but that's an interesting comment. So you're saying like the the type of person that bullies would bully anyway. It just when it when a sexist element is introduced, that's what they tend to. That's how they tend to bully. Yeah, they're the ones who huh. are going to talk over a woman senior to them and then suck up to the guy senior to them, right? They're just they're hmm. they're just those dudes. Right. A guy who's going to be inappropriate in one workplace is going to be inappropriate in all the workplaces. It doesn't matter on management. The good management team who realizes it is going to fire him. Right. Or and without, you know, 50 million severance. It's one of the one of the things we're not looking for. So Google, there was a big piece in The Atlantic maybe two years ago, 18 months ago on Google's board. So when those two senior guys had a big sexual harassment and, and I can't remember the details issue, there was only one woman on Google's board and she spent a year saying, guys, like we need to fire these guys. Like we need to get rid of them. They, they've done a whole bunch of bad stuff. And because she was the only woman on the board for a while, everybody's like, yeah, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. So then they paid them off each $50 million and, and fired them a year later. But why did they spend a year debating it? And, and so you can just see how the bro culture protects people. And so what you want is... You want a board who's capable of firing a CEO when he's inappropriate, not brushing it under the rug. And it's not because it makes us feel good. It's because that's a better managed organization. 
They literally have policies for when people do bad stuff and they can manage it. And then they lose less senior lawyers. They have less turnover. They're better able to attract. And they they understand that it's part of the bottom line. Also, that you can't be an asshole at work. And too many companies are not well managed and allow that behavior to just kind of go, you know, these people who do bad stuff, like they're not doing it as publicly as possible, right? Like bullying and, and toxic behavior, I mean, it's gaslighting, right? They're doing it undercover from, you know, trying to be in a position of power. And it's hard for folks to see. It's hard for good folks who can, even if they're in direct management, directly related to the roles, it's just like high school sometimes in behavior and good teachers and good communities speak up and work against it and bad communities, you know, t- who was it? Somebody was talking yesterday. You can have a teacher encourage bullying, right? There's bosses who yeah. encourage bullying. There's CEOs who say, oh, that doesn't matter. You know, you're, it, and so we're, it, it's, it's a whole big mess and it, it very much applies to the investment industry, but it applies to any role. And, and it just, it speaks to, It speaks to our role as employees in the bottom line. If we're worried or not engaged or people are causing problems or, you know, for me, it's like efficiency issues. If I'm looking at management and doing really stupid stuff that impacts your work, right? Like how, how, how engaged in an organization can you be? So that's why, I mean, that's how governance intertwines with our severe lack of equity in our industry. We need to change it. You know, we're the fourth public equity or public market asset manager in Canada founded by a woman, only the fourth. We're probably the fourth or fifth along only ESG manager founded by a woman in the world. And, you know, what is it? 99% of assets, institutional assets go to white male led founded firms in the US of institutional assets. Even though many of these foundations and folks are focused on racial equity or gender equity and things like that. So we will get there one day, hopefully before I die, you know, where women represent some some significant women managers, women-owned firms represent some significant portion of that. But like we're, again, we, we're lower than we were 20 years ago for women portfolio management, yet it's a really good role for women. I don't care how many podcasts or speaking things I have to do. This industry has so much opportunity, but we can't, we can't change it in the structure that it is. We literally have to throw most of it out and, and rethink the wheel. And I think that's true of lots of industries, but it's particularly given our responsibility, given the assets we manage, given the, our role in the world, we can probably benefit the most. I mean, just, just from client service perspective, right? The wirehouses in Canada, and I'm sure this is the same in the U.S., lose 90% of the widows. Because huh. the so why? here's why. Women are evidence-based. We're not interested in some cool guy's new theory. We and it's because we're outsiders. So I, you know, you you let's say you and I are married and we go into our advisor. And the guy's like, yeah, 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 macro this, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I that that makes sense. And you, you, I wouldn't buy macro. You Don't know what I mean? I, 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 I'm, just <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. I actually I got love for some macro people. And the woman's there going, why are these guys talking about anything other than our actual investments in financial planning? And a lot of retail gobbledygook that's shilled is very short term, very story based, not kind of you know, very a logical evidence-based approach to investing. And so people think women aren't interested. Women are just not interested in the story sales pitch, you know, um, hocus pocus stuff that is frankly a lot of sales pitches in investing. And so they get, they get treated as second-class citizens in an advisor's office, in retail, right? Again, the, the MD who said, this is a great event for your clients and their wives. You know, we, I, my mom, worked for a firm that was founded by two women um, and they had lots of money and they, them and a couple friends were with a large advisor at one of the wirehouses and most of the assets, they all, they were all married. Most of the assets in all the accounts were theirs. They sold businesses. They, they made lots of money. Their advisor switched banks. So they, they decided to go switch banks when they got the call, you know, like wirehouses call all the clients that are leaving to try and keep them with the, the book. 
they all got their husband got the call. Mm. Right? And and if if yeah. the bank had any concept of anything, they would have clearly labeled on those accounts that that you should be calling the oh, wife so they first. Never had the point of, yeah, they never had the point of contact with the person that was actually leaving. Yeah. On the widow side. Yeah, and, and so they can call huh. the dudes, but the dudes all just laughed at them because they're like, you're talking to the wrong person. Some of them may have even considered, you know, talking to somebody, but the, anyways, it, and so that's what I mean. The whole, and this is, this is recent. This is like 2017. This is not in 2012. And so the, the experience for my, my mom, my mother has a PhD in, in marketing statistics from Kellogg. Okay. She's, she kind of knows some math. Okay. Just yeah. some, just a little bit. Every finance person now, probably including my dad and me, but every finance person has treated her, has never, you know, spoken to her. I mean, she loves the governance stuff and stakeholder stuff. Don't get me wrong. She loves what we're doing now. But they've always looked down on her, yet she literally is more math qualified than, frankly, anybody in the investment industry that she's actually come across. Yet, yeah. because it, and so it, it's this, and you could just, just see, anyways, it's... It's a fascinating mess. We can fix it, but we need to acknowledge the problems first. You need to set goals and then you need to work towards them. Um, and it's it's very simple and at the same time, it's extremely hard. It's easy for us because we're starting from scratch, right? I don't need to take a team of a thousand and restructure it and figure out how to go from 12% woman PMs to 18% woman PMs. But it's it's no different than building a client base. Your clients are stakeholders. Your employees are stakeholders. Your communities are stakeholders. Your shareholders are stakeholders. They all matter. And too many investment firms don't think employees matter that much. Can I, sorry, can I circle back to something that you said about the boards? Because you had mentioned bro culture and just like sort of at Google, them not listening to the woman on the board. Is is there any evidence that, like gender diverse boards are more willing to attack sort of divisive issues as opposed to sort of like country club friendliness in the boardroom. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of studies and it's a critical mass in the group, right? So it doesn't work with one woman. Um, and it's, it's around three, right? And again, it depends on the board size board could be six, it could be 15. So yeah, it is in, in, you know, what if your entire, what if your entire board is 50% woman and 50% guys, but they all came from Ivy League schools. That's not diversity. That's not diverse yeah. experience. You still have just as many blind spots, maybe with a little slight gender advantage. So the academic, so there are a lot of board appointees who are quotas, who are token. You, know, you see it on Canadian boards all the time. You know, there's no woman. We There's not enough woman who are qualified out there. Well, you're just not looking. There's t- like, there are tons of women who are qualified to be on boards. They've just not known that corporate directors, a big opportunity for them. They haven't been recruited and their buddies at the golf course, cause they don't go, aren't talking about it. Right. And, and it is it, so many boards are filled with and nonprofit corporate doesn't matter are filled with golf club buddies, whether they be women's yeah. boards filled with gardening guild or junior league, friends or you know the 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 golf boards or the you know the some of the nonprofit large boards in Toronto are the absolute worst they make like large banks look functional um because it's all just like you know my 10 party planning friends and I are just going to do this and there's so much conflict of interest and it's I, I you know I've had to resign from a board for a variety of issues and it was it's so important in my governance training. I did a lot of nonprofit governance training, just so you know. That's where my passion for governance as a topic and specifically stakeholder governance comes from. It doesn't come from the investment industry. Hmm. It comes from being on multiple boards in the nonprofit sector, including really crappy ones that had issues. But we went through transitions. So most nonprofit boards act as a management board. Frankly, most corporate boards act as a management board. In, in a board's job is governance on behalf of the stakeholders, which is always long term. And they are, their job is to supervise the CEO and set long term priorities for the organization. It's very simple, but it's impossible to execute for most groups of people, whether they are, you know, the highest ESG scoring company in the world or uh, you know, a firm like Honeytree. 
governance is really hard and messy because it's you can't it's not just numbers it's people it's systems it's biases it's productivity it's all all that kind of stuff and but but the science is there so you need a critical mass of outsiders who have an outside perspective whether that's cuz they've got a disability cuz they went to a different school cuz they've got you know different sex organs because they have a different training experience and outsiders remove the blind spots. Doesn't mean they're they're smarter or more qualified or less qualified. Yeah, just a different perspective. Yeah, and and so it, a team is you know you don't you don't build a baseball team with twenty five of the best pitchers for a reason. You don't want the twenty five best batters. You need fielders too, right? It's yeah. it, and so a board or a management team or an organization is, is the same. And there's, you know, in, in 10 years, we're going to have a lot more science on this. The, the academics, the quantification of functional teams is, is in the early stages. It is, it is being there, there's some studies and, and stuff being done, but it's really, it's this mat, it's this mesh of organizational behavior, a little bit of finance, a little bit of you know, human dynamics, ecology. And so that's why it's such a messy science. But I think, I think a lot of people have experience with what good governance is in their jobs or their nonprofit or their organizational work and understand it better than that. This framework that we've created, not us, but the ESG industry has created on governance, which is it's what's CEO comp is the board independent is the audit auditor audit committee independent and, and that's kind of what they see as governance. Whereas I hope what I've explained is governance is this kind of magical, mystical bubble that kind of sits over all of it that that is what drives long term success. Yeah. But it's it's tied to all these other inputs. It's not some and that's why I don't like the term ESG, even though I literally use it a thousand times a day, is because it buckets all these measures, these non financial measures forcibly into a bucket when there's so much overlap between them that those inputs themselves and and with the financial yeah that makes sense i mean it the the standard problem of when you know you you try to sort of describe a complicated problem in a simple way it gets reduced to a whole bunch of checklist items and then the actual solutions to the problems get somewhat lost but the people that are claiming to solve them can go out and say, Hey, we're solving them. Right. And it's, they're actually not doing anything, but they got a checklist that says that they are. And like the cereal box, that's their label and go out and sell it. Right. That is ESG. Yes. So I guess what was some of, I mean, I had floated, what are people's biggest problems with ESG? What were some of the responses that you thought were I thought it was interesting how many people agreed with you on a lot of things, right? Most of the complaints were, this is on Twitter for those that don't follow, Liz is at Liz Simi, in case you want to look her up, I'm at Bill Brewster SCG, and what, I mean, most people are talking about the implementation of ESG as opposed to ESG as a problem or something to, to concentrate on, right? That was kind of an interesting set of comments back to the question. Yeah, I I think... No matter where you sit on the political, on your political beliefs, or even religious beliefs, I think that a wolf in sheep's clothing bothers everybody equally. And so I think people who are skeptical like you and people who are really into it like me, when we look at what's available and what's being communicated, it doesn't make any sense. And we can see it for, for the same reason, because the the seller doesn't believe in it innately. And so as as it's executed, it's it's a bit of a mess. And so that's where all these questions and skepticism and disbelief or lack of product fit come from. And it's been quite consistent, no matter who I talk to, no matter what their role, not PMs, though, PMs either think ESG is really stupid or that they're doing it right, just to be super clear. There's not there's not very many there's PMs no one in the middle. like me who I mean, I know we're doing it right, but you know, there's not many PMs like me who who will say that ESG is great, but everybody else is doing it wrong. They they're te- yeah. you tend to be 
on one side or the other. So I just think people... Well, that makes you enemies, Liz. Like, people don't like to hear that they're doing things wrong. No. But I think people who have not been indoctrinated with ESG or have not been... I think, so, you know, one of the... One of my important benefits is I knew nothing about ESG before we started Honey Tree. I knew what inputs mattered without looking at an ESG data set, what we wanted to use in the portfolio construction, but I didn't know anything about that framework. And the more I learn about this framework that everybody's using, the more disenchanted I get with it. So I understand exactly what everybody's looking at. I mean, I our trigger to start the firm, um, one of the big banks released a gender equity ETF. Um, and one of the large pensions put in $100 million to seed it. And the reason... I remember this because we launched ETFs. And I launched ETFs for our firm at about the same time. And I was so excited. I was like, this big bank cares. I don't know why I thought they cared. But this, they care. They're doing it right. This is So then I opened the top 10 holdings. And RBC and TD are number one and two. Now, I could talk about banks and ESG scores for 10 years. but Yeah, you already did. There are, that doesn't sound like top two uh, yeah, potential there. They're, again, bank side, fine. And everybody just yeah. ignores the cap. They don't even report the capital market stuff. They don't even, they, or the asset manager stuff. So, and again, Canada has a diversity issue in our corporate world, like across the board, just to be super clear. Our boards are like 10% less diverse than US boards, gender mm. and racial equity. Anyways, so RBC and TD on a Canada scale, they're not awful. Okay. They've got like more than one woman on the board. Open text, which you probably heard of, some of your listeners will have heard of. Canadian tech company in Waterloo just does kind of lots of my anyways, my brother-in-law works at open text. So I was so excited to see open text in the third position. And I was like, my brother-in-law works for like a equitable tech company. That's amazing. So I go to the website and this is kind of, this is my early stage of kind of, you know, how do, how do you do ESG? And one woman on the board and the head of HR was a woman. And I was like, this is just total bullshit. So that's what people are doing. They're saying, I'm excited. So they're either saying gender equity ETFs are stupid and the industry is stupid and they're all doing it wrong. Why are they using any of this data? Or they're saying, why are they putting these companies in here? What what, what are they thinking? Now, the underlying idea was to get Canadian companies to try and improve their gender equity on their board. Um, or in leadership. And so you'd be on this index and companies would improve. The problem is you put one with one woman on the board as your third position because there's no choice. So that's that disconnect. Hmm. And so you could see where somebody like you would be skeptical and somebody like me would be skeptical for both the same and different reasons looking at that product. So that's happening over and over and over. And it's not, it's not about you care about specific set of values and I care about a specific set of values and we need a product to meet each of our needs. And so direct indexing is the only option. It's a great option for direct indexers, by the way. It's what are these PMs even doing in building this portfolio? I can blatantly see that they don't care. And so that's what that's what happens. And so even you, even a, 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 a non, no, I'm not saying you're not progressive, even a a gentleman. Yes, I'm very progressive. Come on, Liz. who was who was Jeez. raised in a very conservative environment. Here I'm being honest. I'm putting myself out here. But even somebody who was raised in a very conservative environment would go to that ETF because because again, conservatives care about gender equity too. Like a, a conservative folks can care about the environment. Conservative folks care about. I mean, they they think that. Some parts of the progressive spectrum are, are virtue signaling, which, you know, we, we all are in, in some capacity. But, you know, folks believe believe academic research. And so they they see it. They can't articulate it, but they see the disconnect between the end product and the intent and the provider and the the end goals. Right. How, like what? Like everybody, everybody in the ESG industry is cheering BlackRock. Yay, BlackRock. Yay, 2050, net zero, blah, blah, blah. And everybody out of the industry, not everybody, but a whole bunch of folks who don't believe in ESG are responsible are like, BlackRock, are, are they diverse? What are they doing for the environment? Why are they leading this conversation? So skepticism is, is deserved across all, with the exception of, 
maybe about 11 firms globally deserved. And it's, it's, uh, it's not that different than the active management world, but because we're selling morality, it's a little easier for folks to see. It's a little harder for folks to pick apart track records and holdings and portfolio construction on the active side, but it's a lot easier to see when somebody has not really thought of ESG in their ESG product. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I think the other thing that's somewhat tough when I think of ESG is like, you know, I don't know. Let's let's assume that Facebook did have women and minorities in sufficient proportion. You know, if you were to look at what politically has happened throughout the world since social media sort of became growing like a weed, you know, I... I'm not going to say it's causal, but it's certainly correlated with an increase in polarization on both sides. I don't know. Is that social? Like, is that ESG? That seems to be tearing at the fabric of society instead of social, right? But uh, but then, you know, here I built everything that I have on the back of Twitter, and it's made me a much better investor. And you know, I would argue, person, I wouldn't be sitting here with you if it wasn't for Twitter. Right. But on the other hand, I see, you know, the downsides of the tools. So sort of parsing what is good and what is bad and how to outweigh, you know, the other thing, too, is it's like the typical weather forecast. Right. Everybody pays a lot more attention to the bad stuff than the good stuff. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of positive things from different firms that maybe don't get enough attention and all the all the negatives sort of are amplified. So I, I think some of the subjective parts about this this problem are part of what makes it tough. I mean, what's your total investable subset universe? It's got to be kind of tiny relative to all the securities in the world, right? Um, my dad asked why we didn't launch U.S. strategy first. And instead, I told him we couldn't find 20 U.S. companies that would qualify under our criteria. I don't mean to laugh. No, no, it, it's true. It, we, yeah, we, we, I knew we wouldn't be able to. So we built our strategy around avoiding companies like Facebook and not because of the social media, uh, because of Cambridge Analytica and Hmm. not even doing that. It was the lack of disclosure around it. So 18 months of hiding that security breach shows us the governance is incompetent. For that reason alone, they just don't make our qualification criteria. Now, I think the social media question, I mean, like, they're, they're, don't get me started on uh, leaning in and Sheryl Sandberg. Um, if women just work harder, we'd all achieve senior roles everywhere. Like, that's how it works. Just so you know, women don't work hard enough. And, and there's no structural inequity that, that limits our ability to achieve senior leadership roles. Just, just so you know, that was sarcastic. So social, I can tell. <laughs> social media is like sugar and wine or booze. Okay, Booze is bad. It kills a lot of people. However, so do cars, so do factory emissions, so do smog, so do pharmaceuticals, so do hospitals, so does a whole bunch of stuff. So booze also leads to procreation, just saying. Yeah, and procreation is good, actually. That's right. Productivity, yeah. growth, people. I, I've studied a lot of geography and history, and the world was not going to max out. People need to understand how productivity and growth work a little bit better. So I think... I think the problems with social media, specifically Facebook, tie back to their crappy governance. They never had any idea what they were doing. And just because you can grow quickly and make lots of money doesn't, you know, the negative externalities are huge. In, in, but the, from an investment perspective, it's very specifically the dis- disclosure that's an issue with them. And then they've got really shitty diversity improvement too. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, People act like there wasn't problems before social media as well. And while they're amplified, like, you know, I think there's a a particular issue in foreign governments meddling in stuff globally for whatever reason, sales, elections, whatever. That's a problem. However, that existed long before, right? Propaganda and and influence cross-border has always been an issue. And, you know, there, there's something to be said for the loss of journalism and the increase of, I don't know, what do you call it? 
whatever the news media is now, um, because we've defunded and TV, you know, the, the, the transition we've gone through. So I think there's a lot of problems with social media, just like I, I do with traditional media. At the same time, there's so many opportunities, right? Yeah. Growth, networking, businesses, uh, you know, uh, communication. I mean, I'm very pro-influencer economy. I think, I, you know, I worked in market research. So I worked with on large scale advertising and positioning things and the waste that goes into a TV commercial, a million dollars to shoot some 30 second Canadian TV show because everybody wants to go to Tahiti or whatever. And like the whole industry's a mess. So it's great that we've kind of thrown the huh, advertising. So you would say that like an influencer is a net positive on the world because like they're already in Tahiti or something and then they can post the picture as opposed to flying like a whole crew there. Well, you and I are influencers. We're not in Tahiti. I know. It's scary that I'm an influencer. I don't know why people listen to me, but I do appreciate it. Shout out to the listeners. <laughs> now we don't we don't make five grand a post on Instagram for showing off our cooking stuff. But um it, 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 that's a that's a kind of interesting business opportunity. But the the benefits, I mean, I can't, I, I didn't figure out thin twit. I've been on Twitter for a long time, but I, I wasn't, I was more of like a news reader, like an aggregator, yeah. Yeah. had a couple friends and stuff, you know, like a hundred followers. And it wasn't until I discovered thin twit by accident somehow, like somebody referenced it. And I guess this is around when we started Honey Tree, because, you know, you need free marketing channels if you're going to start your own asset manager. That I discovered. Yeah, props for that, by the way. Yeah, thank that you. That takes a lot of guts. Yeah, it takes it. It was lucky. I when I joined my previous firm, they were at fifty million, so I kind of saw what the the early disaster to a billion looked like, which which helped a lot. But yeah, it is kind of a really crazy decision and and totally ridiculous. And I am very proud of myself for that. Good. I hope you continue to succeed. We're doing what we need to do. Our track record's doing what it needs to do. Yeah, inquire people. We won't cite the returns here, but it's <laughs> worth inquiring about. Yeah, we're we're doing our SEC registration right now, so we'll be nice. we'll be we've got a couple. Institutions. Can I say that, or do I need to edit that? What the SEC that people should inquire. I think you you can say whatever you want. You're not registered. Okay, cool. We anyway. So I can't remember what we were talking. About. Oh, well, I just remembered what we were talking about. All right, before. So just going back to the influencer comment so we don't get too far off track. So I I had asked whether or not the the influencer economy is a good thing because it reduces maybe carbon emission or something like that. I mean, is that how you're sort of thinking through some of the reasons that you're a fan of the influencer community or am I totally off base there? I mean, I think if anybody understands the traditional advertising business, the whole thing's most of a waste. It it made sense in a time where TV was our only medium and, and newspapers were our only medium. But influencers, so you, even just on scale, you know, you could pay, there, there's 30 big agencies in the US that get millions and millions of dollars for advertising. But if brands cut that budget and start paying smaller advertisers, now I'm not saying the, you know, the, health influencers, moms of Instagram are the, the right target here, but a reshuffling and a reorganization of advertising dollar spend can always be healthy in, in a variety of ways, in voices, in access, in income equity, in reduction of production costs, right? I mean, and, and nobody's had a choice in the last year. You can't send crews, actually, you can't send crews anywhere. It's You've been able to do production shoots in Toronto and movies have been shooting here all during COVID and even though we have lockdown. So, but the disruption of the traditional structure, I think, is important. So the advertising's traditional structure has been completely disrupted. And that's a good thing for all aspects of, of ESG and, and financials. They, nobody needs to spend a million dollars on an ad. In what folks were spending on Super Bowl ads, I did some Super Bowl ad testing and it's just like, it's a waste of resources. Hmm. It, it, but that's just how everything was done for so long and then it got disrupted. So I'm not saying influencers are actually good for ESG, but certainly yeah, well, I mean, the yeah. traditional structure was not itself ESG friendly. I mean, you just have to look at Mad Men. Um, and the agencies are not, 
the guilty ones in, in miscommunication about cigarettes or drugs or anything like that, but they certainly enabled it. I mean, one of my my favorite stories about Purdue is the, the two brothers who started the company. One invented medical marketing. He built the, it, you know, before then, all of the medical ads for doctors were very technical. And so they brought in, one of the brothers brought in the Mad Men style emotional appeal marketing and, and kind of pioneered it for medicine. So that went hand in hand with lying about their product and driving sales. And so advertising and marketing play a huge role in destroying the world, not in and of themselves, but how they're used by Purdue and you know, the, the companies of the world to to, to sell products. And then ultimately there's a huge negative externality. And then we as a society pay, right? And, you know, one thing I'm going to go slightly off topic because pharma, pharmaceuticals are considered some of the highest impact investments in the world in a public mm. equity sense. So are oil sands companies and so are real estate companies, but that's, that's a different topic. So they're considered, pharmaceutical companies are considered impact because it's really easy to say, their products save lives, even if okay. they you know kill a bunch of people in the process. Yeah, but nobody cares in that analysis about price fixing or price gouging or tying prices to comp so that you know I, I don't know if you saw much of the recent congressional stuff, but you know they're even the even the one pharma company that we thought was not involved in price fixing was 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 the the execs were pushing the prices so that they got over their quarterly. Bonus yeah, so this thing. is an incentive issue, yeah. And so it's, you know, that's, I mean, that's one of my biggest issues with the industry is, look, they're saving lives, but we're going to ignore all the other stuff that they do, right? Mm. And and pharmaceuticals kill a lot of people. Like, I don't know if anybody's looked up the stats in Canada and the US, but a lot of people die, not, and I'm not from oxy drug overdoses, from in-hospital or regular medication not following, like stopping taking the drugs, taking too many drugs, mixing medications, being given the wrong. There's a whole bunch of reasons. So it, it this idea that pharma is innately good in making the world a better place is is completely misfounded, you know, and I think that applies to most industries, even electric vehicles, right? Electric vehicles are 100% impact because their yeah, product this one's interesting to is me. renewable. From nobody, a coal plant. Yeah, nobody cares about how the batteries are made, how the cars are charged, how the charging system's being built, how it's displacing public transit, worker safety, you know, I could go on and on and on. Um, and that's true across the whole renewable spectrum of products, whether it's windmills or cars or, or whatever. So we can't, to say that their impact and you know, a medical supplies company or a scientific company is not because they're not directly curing people, is ridiculous, right? The, yeah. the pharmaceutical companies need a whole bunch of material, hospital. It, it, so it's, it's the whole thing is, it just it's, you know, we're we're escaping from the traditional structure, um, and it, it's really it's kind of fascinating to watch it in real time and both kind of the data that the companies are producing, and the industry kind of trying to catch up, um, in terminology and and how we talk about this. It's a, it's a it's a really big mess. It's a hot mess. That's what I said in Twitter a bunch of times yesterday. So that's a good example of something that's got, you know, pros and cons to it. it, it would you be open to maybe um, saying, you know, I'm willing to change my opinion on, yeah, let's say pharma. I mean, I know that it's hard to say on an entire industry, but let's say management incentives come out and like the proxies show that things have changed and they're more concerned with ESG like true ESG, right? Not like as you define it. Um, is that a scenario? Like would a proxy filing be a catalyst for you changing your view on something? Or are you going to wait to see that that proxy filing and those incentives actually flow through an organization before you give them credit? It's a good one. I mean, I know that there's no like specific answer. I'm just trying to think about how you th how you think through this stuff because yeah. they're really murky decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, just curious. Yeah, I mean the the specific incentives aren't the issue. It's that that it's that somebody was able to take advantage of them in the first place for whatever reason, and it's usually short termism, right? And yeah. it's 
this quarter, this year, this bonus, whatever. We're trying to basically avoid any company that displays that at the management or governance level. Can they fix it? Yeah. Is it as simple as adjusting comp? No, because the same dudes are going to find a way to do something else again. Yeah, and fair. at the expense of whichever stakeholder is being negatively impacted. So so the answer is yes, we, we accept change. And yes, we will add somebody when we don't, who, who, when there's a material change in something that was an issue before. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, it is, it's, it, what does this tell us about the board or the management team that it happened in the first place? And, and yeah, so, so, so yes and no, I guess, to your answer. Yeah, that's, so in, I guess an example that popped into my head as well as Fargo, right? You look at the board and so in that entity, you know, the whole board turned over as did management basically. So would that, I mean, would that be a scenario that maybe you'd say, okay, well, we'll start looking here. We'll follow it. I'm not saying like Wells Fargo is a security you're looking at. I'm just thinking of a, of a scenario where there's a, a large amount of organizational change and then it's, I'm sure it's kind of like dating somebody or trusting somebody that's wronged you in the past. You sort of say, okay, well, I'll trust, but I'll verify. I'll watch it over time. And if you prove it out, then maybe, you know, I'll enter a position a little bit later once I'm convinced that you're living what you're saying, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the best example of that in our strategy is Costco. Hmm. Costco, if you asked me two years ago, I would have said it's the, the, the cause of all the world's problems. Packaging, really? individual. I hadn't been. I was not a shop, Costco shopper, just to be super okay. clear at that point. My perception. Okay. And, and this is true of all grocery stores, by the way. I, I, I think there's the, the grocery industry in general. It's, it's cheap chicken and plastic and individually wrapped containers and not really about whole foods and health and 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 properly. We're, we have really bad produce sourcing in Canada, and I'm a really picky produce eater. Um, and my sisters both work in the, the food industry. So I have very strong opinions about food. And part of that belief was Costco's really just overpackaged stuff in for suburban people with big houses and giant pantries. So then I went through a period of kitchen minimalization. It, the pandemic accelerated a little bit, but I was kind of sick of buying it, kids' lunch stuff prepackaged. I my husband and I are are are, are pretty picky on a couple things and the prepackaged so many wrapper and lunch stuff. And I love cooking. There's, you know, I'm a big cook and baker. I, I love doing that stuff. So we kind of, uh, but maybe 18 months or two years ago, started only making muffins and cookies and stuff for snack, reducing that packaging. And and as a result, we reduced, we, we our kitchen became less waste, more whole foods, just, just we kind of reinvigorated. It. And then we checked out Costco. And over the past year, I realized that it's actually not only is the food the best quality, the operations are more efficient, the packaging's more efficient, and it's actually the cheapest place to buy a whole foods set of groceries at definitely the highest quality, way better than whole foods in in our, in our anyway way. But but I always knew the employees were well compensated. So I always knew that it was one of the best retail places to work in Canada and the US. And then COVID happened and they were the first ones to stand up and make sure their employees had masks and safety. And the mask debate's a different story. The point is they were so stakeholder focused. They were so employee focused in the beginning of the pandemic that while they are rated low on most ESG scales, it was extremely clear from that action alone and of course, my experience shopping there, and I rant about Costco a little bit online, the avocados are just amazing. I cannot explain to you. That action alone, it, it you know, it, it pointed to so many aspects. And so Costco was on our consideration set, and, and we had to fire somebody, uh, and so they they joined in May. Hmm. So that's, so, so, so things can happen like that. You know, Taiwan Semiconductors, we excluded Taiwan until the election last year. And then because the non-China friendly 
group won the election and China didn't invade them, we decided Taiwan was not a dictatorship. And so we allowed Taiwan semiconductors in. So it's, it's also literally the only company in Asia that qualifies on our diversity criteria. And so while we, we don't want to be an entirely U.S. and Europe strategy, although, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, we, we talked about this earlier. We do. We exclude lots of stuff. But again, we're running a 20 position portfolio. So we're excluding everything. So we're kind of comfortable with lack of exposure to certain things. Yeah, that's pretty cool that you end up with those two companies in the portfolio it's a pretty good example of how going through a process looking at it, like those are two great companies right taiwan semi you got some china risk you know that sort of let's all hope that that doesn't materialize because i don't think that would be particularly great for yeah, the everybody's got a big risk if china <laughs> materializes themselves into taiwan that, that, that's right i don't think anybody wants that so that's very cool that you ended up at two really quality companies that, you know, are, it, it, it's hard to see how they're displaced over the next five to 10 years, right? And arguably, uh, uh, nothing is forever, but those are, I think, are as high, high degree of s- sort of certainty from a business standpoint as you can get within their industries. Yeah, and they, uh, they care, they, they have strong stakeholder governance models. They neither are very good at reporting stuff or getting boxes checked. Taiwan Semi is a little bit, uh, a little bit better on some of the environmental stuff, but they are, they are building their company for their customers and their employees. Right? They they realize how important retention is, how important training is, how important worker safety is, but they also understand their role in the entire mess. So packaging reduction, shift to organics. You know, Taiwan Semi reusing uh, as much of their output energy and output waste materials back into the production process, right? It's not, they're not perfect. Again, the best companies in the world have giant flaws, but they're going in the right direction. And, and you can really see it in Costco's, just their their membership growth and retention, right? And, and, and how they've set up their business. They're, it's not just smart. It's a well-run business even though it's retail and you know, the other grocery stores in Canada pay way less, didn't have disaster pay, refuse to have masks and have much higher ESG ratings than Costco. But I will happily draw a line in the sand and say Costco is a much better, more long-term focused company than all those grocery scores, grocery stores, even if it's 30 points less on an ESG score, which is why kind of ESG scores are ESG scores are mostly a practice in somebody checking all the boxes and nobody at Costco cares. To put check the yeah. boxes, then that's how it works. You know, Sherwin Williams, which is not in our global, but is in our uh, our kind of bench. We've got a little U.S. portfolio. Like they don't have a marketing department. They don't mm. have anything. They don't care about any of this stuff. Banks banks have very big marketing departments and CSR departments, and so they check boxes much better and fill out all the stuff in the right places. And so when the scores are done, they they are higher. Um, yeah, and- that's that is the bullshit of it all. It's how yeah. institutionalized and backslappy it is. It's like it's not about whether or not it's reality. It's about whether or not you can sell it as reality, and that's what yeah. pisses me off at the end of the day. Here's my favorite example because everybody listening will sort of understand this. So we at the beginning put both Nike and Adidas in the strategy. I think I mentioned earlier they're going to be at 100 percent recycled inputs for all of their goods. So, I mean, that reason alone environmentally is huge, but here's what's happened. So Colin Kaepernick, okay. Nowhere in any ESG score other than our system, does Nike get any credit for that? Okay. Nike also has actually done a really good job on racial equity in the leadership level and VP and, and workforce, especially given where they're located. But Adidas has a much what higher- What do you mean, especially given where they're located? Well, on Why- the West Coast. Yeah, so what is that? You think that on average the West Coast is not doing a good job? No, I mean, no, I know uh, the tech is the, not. If I'm you just... look at the the diversity of the local area, right? If you oh, start okay. a, if sure. you're if you're sure. if you're headquartered in San yeah, Francisco you're from a bunch of or white people and... Chicago or New York or Toronto, you you've got a kind of thirty to forty percent or thirty to fifty percent non white population, yep. whereas as Washington isn't is not yeah. that. 
Um, no, that makes sense. Even the black population varies hugely by state in, in the U.S., and they specifically on that level. So Adidas has a much higher ESG score and always has had in any system, doesn't matter what you look at. Nike gets docked for the family ownership, by the way. They get no benefit for Colin Kaepernick, and most ESG systems really dock scores when there's a founder involved in the board. That makes no sense. Makes no sense at all. So, But Adidas is all independent, so they're, they must be great at governance. So here's what's happened over the last year. We fired Adidas. Okay? We have not fired Nike. We fired Adidas because their head of equity inclusion said a whole bunch of non-equitable stuff and had to resign. Nike has not had that, but Nike's got a lot. I mean, again, every company has 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 harassment and other issues. It's how they deal with it, too. And and Nike's got that sports issue again. It, Nike is a lovely, messy company, but I'm happy to stand behind them for a variety of reasons. And and Adidas screwed up something with their their the COVID loans. They they were going to get a government loan, and they realized they couldn't pay a dividend. Anyways, we fired them for being scatterbrained, but they're still much higher rated than Nike. They're, but their team's less diverse. It, it, they just, they, it's that governance, it's that, it's that board independence that's getting docked. And Nike has more racial diversity in leadership. And so as a result, has less total gender diversity in leadership, right? And most of the okay. rating systems only look at gender diversity. Gender, yeah. And, Man, and it's stupid. fascinating. Anyways, so it's, it, so I'm, I'm very comfortable standing behind Costco and Nike. Are they perfect? No. But they're, they're, the traditional assumptions about ESG and about them are wrong and dock them unfairly and make them look not as good as companies that are much worse than them on an ESG rating scale, which is why we don't use ESG ratings. We use mostly primary source research from company what's publications. Kind, what's kind of cool about what you're saying is, you know, Hopefully, over time, you can demonstrate that you can generate alpha from almost a variant perception on ESG. That would be a very cool way to attack alpha. Yep. That's the... It's really... If you can isolate a subset of outperforming companies in a disciplined process and not throw that out the window at some point when you get nervous, which I think is hard to do, you can outperform over the long term. But your thesis has to be right. Your selection process has to be right. And how you manage it needs to be right. And the good thing for our team is we're not inventing. We're only inventing how we shoved ESG into it. We know the process itself works. And it works because of that focus on consistency and governance, which should be the focus of sustainable investments, you would think. But again, traditional finance theory comes into all these teams and and says, well, you know, valuation you know, it's really funny. You have teams running valuation analysis on all the ESG components now. And again, a valuation, a methodology that's primary valuation focused, which is lots of shops in Canada. I think you guys skew a little more, less value. value. We have a lot of traditional shops that are very value, deep value, value heavy. That's a shareholder primacy model, right? It also is a model that doesn't measure humans that well, you know, it's very good at measuring factories. And it's not just the value guys, it's it's all of traditional finance theory. At best, we're human cap, cap capital. It doesn't acknowledge the art and the mess that is organizational development and leadership and stakeholder engagement, right? Nobody measures measures People would laugh if you looked at employee engagement scores or employee awareness scores in portfolio hmm. construction. But at the same time, if they're doing a good job with their internal stakeholders, they might be doing a good job with their external stakeholders, right? And if they're not doing a jo- good job with their internal stakeholders, if they have, you know, people complain about car service or, or you know, airlines can't, all this kind of stuff. If they're not taking care of their employees, they're not going to take care of their customers. And over time, they're going to lose business. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think it's intuitive if as long as you ignore traditional finance theory. Yeah. And I think that if if you believe, if someone believes the pitch that you're making, which I think is a reasonable pitch to make, you could argue that somebody that's looking at these things through like traditional valuation metrics is probably going to undervalue the the quality of the company. And that is part
part of where the alpha will come from out of this strategy, I would think. Yeah. As long as you're correct on the ESG metrics and you're, you have a variant perception on those. So it's a sort of a number of steps that I can say, yeah, I could totally see how Liz, you know, outperforms over time. You companies got to work. Companies that are better managed have executable disaster plans that they've practiced, right? You know, the, my, the best example. So a lot of nonprofit boards would not have had a pandemic preparedness plan. But my mom's on this board, this nonprofit board, a pretty large health services organization. And when the pandemic happened, they pulled out their pandemic preparedness plan and they executed on it. And it seems so simple, but I think we can all think of 10 companies that that might not have had a robust plan. And if they did, when they pulled it out, they hit a bunch of walls, right? And it during the pandemic, right? Whether it's opening and closing, worker safety concerns, furloughing, lack of ability to manage supply chain disasters, all this kind of stuff, not lack of backups. And in you can't measure that till shit the shit hits the fan, right? You cannot measure an organization's ability to respond to disaster. The great thing about last year is everybody had to, right? Yeah. And and so you kind of got to see it real time and and that's what we focused on on the annual letter is it was the year that stakeholder governance it was clearly connected to the bottom line for everybody and it it's it's not that it's not that companies that are treating their employees badly can't make a whole bunch of money it's about the sustainability of that over time and we're just trying to avoid those investments and hold you know a lot of a lot of ESG investors hold bad companies trying to change them we haven't talked about engagement yet we need to talk about that and so you have Canadian pensions who are leading ESG investors holding private prisons, holding old folks oh, homes, holding yeah, all this crazy. stuff. And they say that they're engaging. They're working with them to inf- – they're not – private prisons have no place in Canadian yeah, pension or ESG portfolio. But the, you know, the old folks homes, you know, we had a – we have a Canadian strategy that was kind of put together as a joke. But – a uh, old folks home came up on the consideration set like a year and a half ago. And I was like, I think I'm pretty sure ownership doesn't care about people because it's all been it's all been sold off to corporate large corporations used to be provincially managed. And while well, they all went down 60 or 70 percent last year, but the pensions were all holding them. And, and my issue is if the pensions have these teams working on ESG and engaging with their holdings like they say that they're doing. Do you think they would have noticed all the issues with old folks' homes and advocated for them in the year before COVID when all the funding was took taken away for inspections? But of course, they don't care. They just care about the bottom line. They don't care about the long-term impact of these companies on, on retention or their like customers dying. Anyways, and they all died in COVID. And it, it was very specific to Ontario and where a lot of these nursing homes are from. So that's why I get very skeptical about the folks, the big institutions who say, well, you can't divest. You got you to gotta hold the company and change it. Well, then change them. Don't sit yeah. there and use engagement as an excuse to, to fit your traditional theory beliefs about sector exposure. That's two totally different stories. Um, yeah, so that's one of that's my big point. issues with the ESG industry, especially the large pensions and allocators. You know, they, 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 it's, 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 you can hire 30 or 40 ESG experts. They can look at all the risk and stuff. But if this is how you're executing your investments, you, you don't really care. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and to the, to your point on engagement, I don't know where the uh, first of all to, how do you how do you engage with a private prison like I'm not sure how you possibly can if you're going to bill yourself as ESG and then two what are the metrics that somebody can judge your engagement on right like how do I know that you're engaging rather than just being able to say oh we're engaging like okay <laughs> what does that even mean like you going out to dinner with these guys and having yeah. steak it's uh, it's really funny so most of the world's leading ESG managers, who all their assets are ESG, who are leading all the ESG conferences or impact or whatever, their annual ESG reports are, let's say, 12 pages. 
of which eight to 10 are their engagement summaries. So they're not reporting their team diversity. They're not reporting any of the environmental mm. stuff. They're, they're just reporting the engagement stuff they've done. Now, at one end of the spectrum, engagement can work. A long time ago, and still now, nuns and Quakers go and buy company stock and show up and cause hell at the meetings. And sometimes it works. It can add safety mechanisms to guns. It can, to, can do some other stuff. For the most part, these engagement reports are being produced in, in instead of looking at actual ESG data and investing in companies making the world a better place. Um, yeah. and, and, and they're used to justify traditional finance beliefs. There's a place in the middle where it works. You know, so one thing, the Canadian Pension CPP, who I love to throw under the bus at the same time, they've done a couple good things. The CPP and a couple other pensions. Was that you were, oh, sorry, let me close my outlook. I forgot about that. <clears throat> CPP and, I don't know, let's say four, four of those pensions decided maybe five years ago that they were just going to vote against every board slate that didn't include a woman. And it's worked. Now, now they're moving on to two women. One day they'll figure out racial diversity, but you can see where, now, who wants to invest in a company that needs to be forced by a pension to put a woman on their board is, is the other end of the spectrum. I mean, that's obviously what we're, we're not looking at. We are, we would only invest in a company that has been willingly disclosing their diversity data for a long time. So most of the engagement activity, most of the vote, most of the engagement activities around votes, some activist votes. And then of course the big folks, you know, meet the teams and pretend they, they care about ESG. But a lot of the the votes, the successful votes, are pensions and and big investors getting companies to disclose their diversity data. So Amazon still won't disclose disclose their diversity data. So you have all these activists. So so there's a purpose there. At the same time, if you're an ESG investor, why are you investing in a company that won't disclose basic stuff that you need to assess anything? So you can see where the whole kind of the it's that it's that traditional theory against what do we do with this data against, and, and they've always been big engagers and proxy voters anyways, prior to the ESG era, you know, they need uh, teams to show up and talk everywhere, but that's why it's messy. We, we engage on reporting and specific issues within the company. We only hold companies that we don't need to micromanage. I was, we were talking, my co-founder and I, there was something on a proxy vote. I'm trying to remember what it was, but I said, if they're going to put a board, if they're going to bring a board member on that we have to vote against, we're probably going to fire the company, right? Mm. If we don't yeah. trust them enough, they're nominating team enough that we need to micromanage board selection, auditors, whatever, whatever you know being voted on, then we don't, we shouldn't own yeah, that company. They shouldn't, yeah, they shouldn't qualify anyway. Yeah. So, and yeah. that, and we're lucky that's our approach, and it allows us to, you know, we're. We, I was trained in a shop that never met management anyways to reduce the human bias of going golfing with the CFO kind of thing. Yeah. And so I'm a big believer in that. At the same time, you know, we all like forced arbitration. There's so many issues that, that govern that, that are problems for the industry, racial equity, mm. all this stuff. So we can engage on that. At the same time, most of our companies are, are leaders in that and figuring it out. I mean, that's why we picked them. Yeah. So that's we have a very particular opinion on that. So it's both good and bad, but it's it's a lot of the uh, it's a you know the the private prisons or or whatever. And, and Calpers I think was doing that too two years ago. Like Calpers, which is like the leading ESG pension in the U.S., was like let's go visit the private or the border prisons, which I think are even worse than the private prisons. You know, let's go let's go see if we should divest from them. Like that's, that's where, that's where the investment industry is. There's nothing wrong with investing in anything, but there's a big problem in saying that you're ESG or sustainable yes. or long-term committed yes. and holding that shit. Unless yes. you're a nun fighting to get like guns changed or something like that, then you can do it. A hundred percent. So that's my, that's big what beef. I hate. I hate fake, fake stuff. Yeah. Because it's like you're a halfway crook. You can't say that you're one thing and and then the other. That doesn't fly with me. Yeah. So where um, 
where do you see this all going? I mean, uh, uh, one thing that I was thinking about is let's say that like all the ESG, uh, let's say that this ESG um, theme goes, you know, throughout institutional allocators, they sell all their cigarette holdings, the stocks implode, these companies still have huge cash flows. Some somebody comes in and buys some of the shares. The company buys their shares in. That person that just like sort of broke the prisoner's dilemma just became a rich guy or girl because they sort of cheated in a you know. So there's a lot of like incentive to not participate. On top of that, you've got indexing, which by definition doesn't care about anything. So how how does this all change the world, and like what difference does it actually make outside of potentially, you know, creating an opportunity for you to outperform, which would be a very cool output because it's clear that you believe in what you're doing. The business round table, I think it was last year, the year before, I think it was BlackRock driven, but there was a bunch of folks involved. And there's been a couple initiatives like this that are really focused on changing the business perspective from shareholders to stakeholders and changing the perspective from short term to long term. Because it's better for the bottom line. Also, it's better planning and better leadership and all that kind of stuff. So that's where it should go. What we shouldn't, if we want to be more efficient and more productive, we cannot have CEOs sending memos two days before quarter end driving production. That's just not good management. Um, You know, we can't have Facebook's, board twiddling their thumbs for 18 months on a data breach because it's bad for a whole bunch of stuff. We can't, we have to, we have to fix problems because they cost us, whether it's corporately or as customers, or as employees or as society. And the benefit of that is productivity and growth. If we continue to keep women or racially diverse folks as a minority representative in some of our most profitable businesses and, and, and far under our natural abilities in terms of leadership roles and things like that, we won't grow economically, right? Financial productivity, you know, and you just have to look at the jurisdictions that have Quebec has universal child care now. So that increased women's workforce participation, something like 5% in the 10 years that it was implemented, and people don't understand how much tax revenue <laughs> increasing 5% of the workforce who was previously not participating in actually adds. It adds far more than the cost of the childcare. And the same is true for any individual or, or group or population, whether they're outsourced in the Philippines, whether they're factory workers in Texas, it doesn't matter. The more training, the more capacity any of those employees have, the, the it, it, it that's what drives productivity so the that's you know my my end goal is to and it's not going to happen for most of the industry but is to provide this mindset in asset management that the long term is good that governance matters that maybe we're doing a whole bunch of things wrong but we can make them better that you can invest in companies that that Companies changing the world for the better are a better investment long term, that there's a risk and a cost to all these negative externalities of companies who don't care about their stakeholders. But really, I think, and I think I'm doing a pretty good job of it, is just even talking about stakeholders in our industry, just the shift alone, helping facilitate that shift from shareholder primacy to stakeholder governance will make everybody's lives better. Because customers and employees matter to the bottom line. And when you when you treat them as capital or when you treat them as a secondary thought or not that important, you, you, you lose out on opportunity as a company. And I think, you know, anybody who studied governance or leadership science or sports leadership understands this intuitively. The sum together, the parts together are what matter. And a, and a corporation's just a team. And if the team's not working effectively, if they're not driving towards the same goal, they'll hit a roadblock. And so I think it's it's really, I, I just think the industry will will move because of the science, not the whole industry, but enough of it towards that discourse. At the same time, it's the stakeholders who are going to drive the change. It's the my mothers, it's the millennials, 
It is the students and faculty at endowments uh, at schools who have driven, I don't know, we're like 30 U.S. schools gone fossil fuel free. It's fascinating. We only have one in Canada. It's the union reps who are going to realize they've got a 7% holding in Amazon. It's the, you know, the foundations working on, there was a Toronto Star article, which is great this week. There's a large, there's a billion dollar foundation in Canada. It is the leader in impact investing, leader in ESG, works on racial equity, poverty, gender equity, specifically in Canada. 80% of their funding goes to white-led charities in Canada. You can't, I mean, the, the city, Montreal, where they are, Toronto is 50% non-white. And, and so they are, mm. even that's where we are. That's why when people say ESG is done and figured out, I'm like, no, it's not. We are so early in the asset transition, right? So they haven't even figured out supplier diversity in their managers yet. The U.S. Mm. is big on that, by the way. Everybody in the U.S. cares that I'm a woman. Nobody in Canada cares that I'm a woman. So you can see how it's being driven. Like we can do whatever we want as an industry, but at the same time, it is being driven by the end stakeholder. And, and I get to see it firsthand because we, we talk to a lot of these, these, these institutions, obviously. But the same, thing, the same thing happens for an advisor, right? They, and this is what happened to me when I, I was an advisor for a year. I had, I had gay and lesbian clients who wanted ESG portfolios and they couldn't really articulate, but they knew what they didn't want. And so we were slowly making products and stuff, but it's really, it's what the end client wants. And we have not done a good job of articulating it and providing the right product set. And so I think in five or 10 years, we might have a, a small, reasonable selection of non-lying ESG, like people who are really living it. And, and again, there's there's some of this around the world, but it, it's hard to find and it it's... It will attract a broader group of people to our industry. It will, I obviously have an outperformance argument here, but it's it, it's really so, if we can get rid of traditional theory, I think we also, not, you know, not get rid of traditional theory. If we yeah, can but unbox, think differently. If we can yeah. unbox ourselves from the constraints of traditional theory as an industry in, in our industry, investment processes we can also do that in the rest of our business right yeah. and so i think yeah. that's that's why i think the stakeholder thing matters so much and it and that's why i don't like to talk about this as values and personal beliefs it's not this is bigger than all of us it's it's how we're productive as a society and and companies are just kind of a little microcosm of it and you can see it operating but you know it, it's about community it's about community communication it's about sharing it's a uh, one of my friends is a Mennonite and he's one of the leading kind of original impact investors in Canada and I I sent him some stuff early on about us trying to discuss impact and he's like well what it is is we just we live we live to serve the community every aspect of what we do has to be to to make the world a better place for everybody our investments, our community work, our jobs, our business. And, and so those are the, the Quakers and the Mennonites and the nuns and the, have been leading the real conversation. And then it got hijacked by the stupid banks. And so now hopefully what, and, and asset managers. And I so, can't imagine banks ever doing something like that. Come on. I, uh, I, can, I can talk about banks forever. So there's hope it's going to happen. I just, I'm going to point out that the number of media inquiries I've got for just my rants on Twitter on this topic suggests that there's so much appetite for a different discourse on this, right? Yeah. So it's not, and, and there's so much deserved skepticism because the products don't match the end client's needs. And that's yeah. what folks, even if, the, even if the person looking is not an end client, somebody like you can still see where the disconnect is. So that's going to catch up to everybody eventually, and hopefully there's a whole bunch of cool boutique ESG shops out there with a variety of strategies for everybody to invest in, maybe with some diverse owners, and yeah. you can change the industry. Well, that's awesome. I, I, I'll tell you what. I respect people that are authentic and are doing something that they believe in, and it's very clear that you are, and you know, from that perspective, I'm, I'm rooting for you. I don't know if you've totally changed my portfolio in one conversation, but I do look forward to speaking with you over time. 
And, you know, I would just encourage people that have listened to this and liked it to really think about what Liz said with the end client, because if it's something that resonates with you, it's probably going to require finding an active manager that cares about this and implements it in the right way, because index funds are not going to do this, and neither is a big industry that's incented to just kind of keep the status quo. So, you know, the vote with your money and your dollars and your time would be my my uh, non non financial advice <laughs> advice. So, Liz, I, I do appreciate you stopping by. There's a couple things we didn't talk about, so maybe you'll come back and we'll talk about them a different time. Absolutely. It's my favorite topic, especially when I don't need to be super nice about it, because sometimes I have to, you know, when I'm around the industry, I have to tone my insults down a little bit. But given you're not going to get 46 CEOs of ESG funds listening to this podcast, I can kind of get away with more stuff. You don't stuff. know that. Maybe. If, if it's if it's successful enough but uh you can always let your hair down here there's there's no rules on this podcast platform so i appreciate you coming on and being honest so thank you thank you for having me.